Hey, hey, hey. Welcome, Tim Sheaf. How's it going, dude? Hey, Mr. Ted Carr, my friend, fruitarian. How are we it, doing? Man. Yeah, good. It, it, like we talked about, it's been uh, like a couple, maybe, how long was the last time we hung out in real life? Was it like three years? It must be three years. Was that in London? That's um, way too long, bro. <laughs> it's not our choice, really, is it right now? No, that's way too long. Like if, if we had it our way, if I had it my way, dude, we'd be hanging out at least once a year. At least. Either Thailand or Hawaii. Thailand or Hawaii. Yeah, I'd I don't mind the UK in the summertime too. Thailand. Where would you, UK is cool, but yeah, I could, you know, Lake District or something. But where, where, what would you choose right now? Hawaii or Thailand? I, I'd, I'd, I'd go to Hawaii with you. I'd go to, uh, I'd go to Hawaii up into, the, up into the forest waterfalls. Yeah, that was pretty special on Big Island, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, man. So, so when I first met you, dude, so m when I first laid eyes on you, you were doing back flips or front flips, I think front flips over a fire at Woodstock. And I was like, who's this show off? And then I'm watching you a bit more and I'm like, whoa, he's actually really good. And then the next day I see you on the basketball court and you're doing handstands on top of like a basketball rim. I'm like, how the hell do you even get up there? Let alone how do you have the bravery mm -hmm. to do handstands? I'm like, this guy's really good. And then I find out that you're like a, a parkour guy. Uh, and I thought that was, and I saw you doing like one, you're doing like a one arm handstand or something at one point too. I was like, yo, this guy's really, really good. Uh, and then I actually sat down and spoke with you for, I don't even know if you remember, but I sat down and spoke with you for a good 20, 30 minutes at Woodstock. And it was one of those like super special conversations where I'm like, wow, like we just went really deep into a topic that I, don't think I could have gone that deep with anyone else at this festival. Like it, just, it had to be you in that moment sitting on that bench. So I was like, this guy, this guy's like a special guy. And then I think our relationship then developed with me just offering to film you from time to time, right? Create some videos. Right? Yeah. We started to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hawaii, we shot in Hawaii and those videos yeah. turned out really cool. Shot some photos and uh, yeah, you, you just started to get into videography yourself. Yeah. And I was, was I'm always uh, down to be creative. I like working with a videographer, someone who has an eye, their vision, and I can be on the camera and kind of work my vision. And we worked we work together, didn't we? It's teamwork. It was yeah. really cool. Oh, super cool, man. The, I think the, the funnest, the funnest shoot. T -shirt. Yep, for ethics, yep. And then the funnest shoot I think I did with you was in the UK at the Ninja Warrior Training Center. Ah, the because it was the UK Fruit Festival, and we went to the yeah Tewksbury to Dion's place. Yeah. It was a little. Yeah. There's a, he's got a much bigger spot now, but uh, that place was really cool, right? Yeah, man, that was that was super cool. You were training for for an event there, and uh, so so people, a lot of people in the past, you were known for being like the parkour slash ninja warrior guy back many years ago. In fact, I was on a plane ride home from a festival, and on the plane. Guess which get what they're showing on the plane. Like, I didn't have a choice. I couldn't select my channels. They were showing the entire plane, you on Ninja Warrior. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and then I remember filming you in, in, in downtown UK for, for a project. And we get out of the car, we start filming, and a fan comes up to you and she's like, Oh my God, I saw you on the news the other night. You did such a good job. So it's like people like know you, man. You're out there. And the reason I wanted to do this interview with you is because. You live life very differently from mainstream people. Like very, <laughs> you, you, are, you are a black sheep, my friend. You yeah. are a black sheep. And uh, there's not many people out there like you. I, I don't know. Like I, it's hard to categorize you. It's hard to like Thank put you, you in a category of being like. Compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it's dope, I, man. I appreciate that. I, I, I really lean into life, man. And, and once, once I, I realized how little, um, the mainstream's narrative and uh, just how the mainstream does almost anything is actually a, a dead end road. Once you realize there's so many dead end roads following that path, you it quickly opens your mind and your heart to explore everything that's almost in the opposite direction of that. And all these other fringe, these fringe uh, practices and, you know, healing modalities and diets and everything like that, that, the first reaction of um, any person in like an average supermarket would just be to scoff at or to think it's dangerous or, or, or stupid or because, because, because everyone else doesn't do it. And yet that is so beautiful to discover things in those realms 
that served you greater than anything else has served you, you know? So yeah, I, I like to consider myself kind of a life scientist and I like to explore everything fringe that makes me weird to most normal people in a way. You just said something really deep, man. I've never heard anyone say that before. I've never even considered what you just said before, but you're like most mainstream things, most mainstream paths are just take you down dead end roads. That's it. Yeah. And you get to the end of the road and you're like, fuck, what was this for? But, yeah. but you're saying when you go the opposite way, it's just, there's like this whole nother path that you can take and a whole nother view you can take on. Is that right? Yeah. And there's, it's like, there's rocks that you look under these rocks that they're, that, you know, like, don't look under that rock. No, someone's done that before and they found nothing. So you don't even need to look under it. And I'm like, well, I haven't been under there. I haven't looked under that rock, you know, let's experiment with that. And then it's like, well, there are people actually that do say that that's beneficial, that you can do this and you can get benefits. And oh yeah, but they're the strange ones. They're the weird ones. But, and it's, I don't know. It, it's, it's, um, it's a very, it's a fence that you're either on one side or the other of, of that fence. And mm-hmm. it takes real, I think it takes, um, and I don't want to, not trying to blow my own trumpet, but I mean, you're in the same boat as me with this. And probably most people listen as well. It takes a certain amount of emotional bravery to challenge the status quo and the mainstream path on stuff because everyone else is doing it it just feels like the safe thing to do and so most people are living in that place of i'm scared and this is safe because everyone else is doing it and yet that's just not a life is it you for some of us you quickly realize that's not you're not really living um, fully as you as you can be as as when you start to challenge that stuff and start to explore things for yourself and there's so much to explore in the world if you if you start experimenting for one and then you start to strengthen your intuition about you start to sense when you're on to like a new YouTube thread or, you know, these rabbit holes that you dive down, like I say, the mainstream path, there's a lot of dead ends, but there are the rabbit holes are where, you know, if I like to accelerate myself down these rabbit holes and there's just so much to learn. There's so much to discover for yourself. If you're you know brave enough to, to do that and you can go into it, with an open mind and I say an open heart, but really one thing I learned lately was that that, that to analogize the mind is an airlock, right? For your heart, because beliefs, knowing is in your heart, right? And ideas and beliefs are more in your head. And so for something to go from your head to your heart, it has to pass through your mind. And the mind is then airlock. It's that safe space for like, okay, this idea can go in, I'm not going to poo-poo it or I'm not going to believe it straight away, but I'm also not going to dismiss it straight away because often people just dismiss everything and they need to be proven otherwise. And often proof won't allow itself to be there if there's doubt, if there's if there's arrogance about what you already believe, the new truth or the op- of the other option might not prove itself. So the airlock in the, is the mind is this safe space for you to entertain ideas without accepting them, but just to explore them without like i say attachment to either way and then you might discover something that can sink to your heart that most of the people don't believe because they've already been too skeptical and never approached it or something like that so learning to use our mind in this way as it's safe to allow ideas in the mind it doesn't mean that we've accepted them in our hearts and and so yeah this is something i started to to just to see it that way has helped me just to keep going with it do you think some of your emotional bravery has been developed from you performing these physical stunts of like physical bravery? hundred percent. That's such a great question. And I, I, I recognize that myself, but no, you're the first person that's ever asked me that as that that's the, I, I think so. I think there's a thing with parkour and I started to realize lately why parkour is so special. Cause I'm starting to look at children are greater blueprints for how humans should be living and could be living. If we were to evolve, if we were to actually grow up, but retain a lot of our child qualities, parkour is something that we would do. But often we grow up and we retain this, the the adults who are competitive and we get into this competitive track, which, you know, I'm as guilty of that as anyone of, right? Of doing competitions. And that's where the sports come about. And, you know, I, 
I, I like racing as much as anyone and run, running races and football and Formula One and all that stuff. But it's all competitive. But parkour in its essence is the child on the playground, but with the adults, you know, strength and, and mm. development of uh, mm. bravery and courage and, and um, uh, like awareness of their body. They've grown that and honed that awareness that they got on the playground to, to a bigger scale. And so, yeah, I, I just think starting to look at, okay, children are a better blooper because you look at childs, how they choose their food if they're not been emotionally traumatized. You know, they, they can eat intuitively better than yeah. adults. I'm sure you can agree with that. They sleep, they can nap, they can enter sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems much more dynamic than most adults can. They're not, they don't want cigarettes and alcohol. Their choices like that, their ability to cry and not suppress it and to express their emotions freely. So children have these great abilities. And so I, th I look at, okay, so how does the children express themselves physically? They use every, every cell. They, they really commit to everything they do. When you do parkour, you have to commit everything to everything you're oh. doing. And often we do other sports where we don't quite have to, or we tempo it or we, you know, jog it or, or yeah. we just, um, so there's, I don't know, there's a bit of a tangent, but just, I just think I, the more I'm trying to look at children for blueprints on how to Dude. find health emotionally, physically, and mentally, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. A lot of great points there, man. One of the things as a fruitarian that I see a lot is, and I'm going for walks, I see kids just instinctively want to climb trees. <laughs> want to climb the trees. And the parents are like, no, get down from there. You're going to hurt yourself. So they're like telling the kid, parents you are fear. going to hurt yourself. Yeah. Right. And who wants to be hurt? No one. So the kids were like, oh, I shouldn't do that then. Or uh, another thing is like a kid will just naturally yeah. instinctively reach for a berry. They sees a berry in a bush. It wants to reach and grab it. And then the parent will be like, oh, no, you know, um, don't ruin your appetite. We need to eat, you know, our, our burger, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's just the kid knows they want to climb. The kid's designed to climb. The kid knows they should eat the berry. They're designed for the berry. Um, and like you're saying, emotionally, too, kids, I, I find that they're, they're so they're so perfect emotionally. Yes, they'll cry. Yes, they'll scream when they're upset, whatever. But they'll also forgive very quickly. Because they express that emotion, yeah. yeah. Because they cry, they're released. Right. And they can forgive and forget, yeah. You're yeah, right. as, a, as opposed to holding. Kids don't hold grudges until they learn to they hold don't. a grudge. Yeah, because they're constantly in emotion. They're, there's never a second they're not in emotion, be it positive or negative. They're in the emotion and they ride it out and move on. Yes. And how dude. many of us are in, in our emotions constantly? Like, dude, it takes so some practice true. to get back to that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's That's so where true. life is. That's why days last longer. That's, you know. Right. Wow. So, yeah, there was, uh, I, I recently watched a, uh, a Michael Jackson documentary, dude, and said something very similar, how he loves, and he got, he got such a bad media blast when he was still alive mm. for like um, doing bad things to kids or whatever, right? But turns yeah. out if you dig and dig and dig, you realize like, apparently he didn't do anything bad. It was just accusations, right? And, yeah. and, and the main accusation was from a kid who... There's actually a documentary with Michael Jackson and that kid in it. And you can see that kid is like telling everyone, oh, Michael Jackson's great. He's awesome. It's like super genuine from the heart. But then like a few months later, that kid apparently is the one who accused him of doing something. It's probably his parents accused him of whatever, right? The point is, yeah. Michael Jackson kept saying over and over and over again, the reason he loves kids is because like you said, they're the blueprint for like how we should be living. Kids are like, they have the blueprint for how we should be living. It's exactly what you said. They're just yeah. perfect. And like they they're, they're, show us what we can be. Yeah, well, we, as I said to the dead end, and I think that's exactly the point. When we've become adults following every other adult, that's the dead end. And the child is, is not gone down the dead end yet. So we can go back to the child and then we don't actually know what the potential of being a grown up is if we use the child qualities and we don't lose the child qualities because of this ego facade thing that we've chased with competitive it's competitive in so many elements of life right in relationships in um, yeah. business in sports and whatever I and mean, there's just so many things that, that and you know we lose our physical abilities we lose our this is why i'm so passionate about biomechanics is because how many adults 
they get injured at some point and then they can't do the sport they're doing. So they'd rather they go out for a drink on the weekends with their friends rather than do sport. But if you gave them the choice, hey, you could fit if you just press this button, you'll have your body back and you can choose one or the other. Do you want to play sport or do you want to drink on the weekend? Well, I think most people would choose sport, but they've just given up the fact that they're, oh, my, I've got old, my old age has got to me rather than taking some responsibility, which again, we were not taught that you can be responsible with your health right. to a point where it actually makes a difference because they're just, you know, at the time that we're in right now, I've not seen them once mention how we can strengthen our immune system and take care of yeah. our own it's just absolutely i mean it doesn't take much to see what's going on and yet so many people haven't seen it yet but yeah, yeah you know if if we can get back to that look at children like i said closer to the blueprint they're not the they're not the end product they're just the back of the dead end road they're just back to the mm. main road and then right, we can right. find out you know. <laughs> children are back to the main road it's hilarious that's the main you know, and then thing- we can grow up with with that playful you know that's how science should be done that's how tesla the mm. man behind you like he was doing science with his imagination he would make I, I remember reading about him he would create inventions and he'd check they worked all in his mind the law the laws of the universe functioned in his mind so he could invent something until it worked and then he'd make it in real in reality in the physical reality so he could already know in his head and it's like well that's a child's imagination i've that's something i realized lately like i'm trying to write down what do children do oh they imagine stuff so i'm like trying to spend some time imagining nowadays as well and that's you know that's a skill that can be grown up but yes wow dude that's dope i like that i like that i like that it is a skill it is a skill and it can be developed. This this skill of imagining and visualizing and and, and some people say they can't visualize. Okay, but then at least they can tap into the feeling of what it would feel like to to have that thing accomplished or created. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So very cool, man. Mm, I like that. Children are back to the main road, and then it's up to us to then develop that as we it's see. Good fit. for what that is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One thing I would love to talk with you, but I don't think we've ever talked about it before. You mentioned it a couple times here, though, is. Um, Competition, competition. So both of us, we have a history in sport, in competitive sport. And both of us also have a history and a presence now in like creativity and creation, creating cool things and collaborating, Mm. which is kind of like the opposite of competing, right? Collaborating, competing um, in a way. So was it you? Was I I playing Mario N64 with you in Hawaii? Did we get uh, maybe Mario, Mario, Kart? Kart. Mario, Mario Kart. Mario Kart, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mario Kart. Yeah, yeah I must have been with you, dude. And it was yeah. like we had some close games on Rainbow Road and shit. <laughs> yeah, no, I love Mario Kart, man. I really love Mario Kart. So, that, so uh, yeah, I go the all, limit I, of my competition. Yeah, because I don't like shoot 'em up games. Right. But I, I feel like a racing game with a friend is a fun competition, yeah. you know? Yeah. Super but, fun. But maybe, yeah. Super, especially when you got the, the computers in the way, too, you know? Like the, 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 who, who can yes. like the who can throw like the, the the luck factor in there right like bowser comes and just smacks you out and blue shells can, yeah nothing you can do right so that's super fun uh so yeah i i actually quit triathlon because i didn't like the competition i love training i love being fit i love the endurance I love the cardio i love being at my peak performance but i didn't like showing up at a race with the intention of trying to beat everyone and so when I would win a race, I would actually feel bad for the people who didn't win. And when I would lose a race, I'd feel bad because I didn't win. So either way, I was like, I'm screwed. Whether I win or whether yeah. I lose, I'm screwed. You recognize because that you were never satisfied either way. Yeah. No. And, and my training was for the wrong reasons. I remember doing these sit-ups and I was like, I was like I'm going to do more sit-ups than the other guy because I need to beat him. And I also remember being in a, in a really dark way. I was actually kind of glad that I heard somebody got injured and they couldn't compete. I'm like, oh, good. He's not going to be there. Like, that's brutal, dude. I don't, I don't want that's that. Not cool, is it? Yeah. I don't, no, I don't. I don't like that. No, but but I've, 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 it's not. It's not. It's not just you. I've had the same feelings, and it's like well, I don't want to feel that about another human, right? Yeah, but competition it 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 requires you to feel it that fuels way because that. Yeah. because the go- it fuels that because yeah, the goal is to win, and for you to win, someone else can't. So whatever the reason is, yeah, a big reason I quit triathlon was because of that. Now I'm curious with you, you. You're like me, sure. We like some competition from time to time, Mario Kart, whatever. But you were also doing parkour just for fun a lot, right? 
you loving the expression of parkour and then you got into ninja warrior how did you first get into ninja warrior and what was it like to compete with something that you just love doing yeah well i did compete in parkour competitions as well that was the thing but it definitely there was a split in the community because at one point free running competitions didn't exist and then they did and we were in that generation when they didn't till they did and there was a 50 50 split of people that were like this will ruin parkour this isn't cool it's not the essence this isn't what it's about and then there's other people that were like yeah but we can make money and we can get you know notoriety and we can get publicity publicity and it's like mm. i i i recognize that the part of me that chose that path there was a guy who's probably the best free runner of all time we many people would say daniel Lebaca, who was completely against competition and I always understood why I always, and I always respected why. And yet I was still like, I don't know if it's because of my, because every, everything we, all the decisions we make essentially t- boil down to childhood traumas. That's what I've learned. And my relationship with my father was that he would only really show love towards me in a warm, loving way when I was successful in, uh, either intellectual pursuits with school or with sport. And that was just how he, he didn't know how to be unconditionally loving, right? And so I somehow, I think, rec- like connecting the dots now, I feel I chase um, sporting endeavors because I link it to being loved by, by my father. So in some deep, you know, sub- subconscious mm. way. And so I chose the route of competition and I ended up, you know, I did the, got into Ninja Warrior, which essentially is kind of like a parkour competition. But again, some parkour people snubbed at Ninja Warrior because it was a bit gimmicky. It is a bit gimmicky. Um, but it was just another chance for me to test myself on another course. And I wasn't afraid. I was never scared of, um, that was another thing. Some of the best athletes tried competitions and they weren't that good when the spotlights were on because it was a different kind of, add an element that they didn't like yeah. they felt uncomfortable in and i somehow felt for some reason felt comfortable in it and so it wasn't just who's the best on the course it came down to who can deal with the pressure of everything else as well and i just was able to do that better than some at the time and so yeah i got into ninja warrior the it would compete in america the first because i was had i've got american citizenship and then uh, it, it eventually came over to the uk and i competed in the uk but i I always said with Ninja Warrior, it's, it's you versus the course. It's you versus the course. Okay. And you're not, you're not, they, they have done competitions where you race one on one, but mostly it's just you versus the course. And if you get through, then you get through. Yeah. But having said that, the way you said you were happy when people uh, couldn't make the race or whatever, I've, I've seen other people fall in and felt happy that, that, you know, that means I've got more chance of winning. I definitely have felt that, but I recognize that that doesn't come from a very loving place within me. And I, w- I would like to, and I'm working towards uh, removing that emotion that's, that drives that within me. And I recognize it's from childhood. Now it's just the, the tough process of uh, getting the thorn out, you know. There's a, there's a beautiful audio I think you can find on YouTube. I think it's like 54 minutes long and it's called The Case Against Competition by mm. Alfie Kahn. Cool. And it's beautiful. And I'd love what's, to hear that. I, that sounds perfect. Yeah. what's ironic is when I first got into triathlon, I was looking for audios to listen to while I was running and biking. And I would often listen to that. And I was trying to, I was trying to, uh, trying to prove him wrong in a way, trying to say like, Hey, I understand <laughs> this case against competition, but like, maybe I can be different. Maybe I can. And I had a vision of maybe I can be the guy who gets to the end of the race, but doesn't cross the finish line. Dude, I have the exact same thought. I've been thinking that lately as well, because I'm trying to get back into running. And I'm like, how about you get there and you just don't yeah. cross the finish line? Yes, dude. That's hilarious. If enough people so, do that, we could we could take yeah. out competition. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 yeah, I thought that. And then, but, but ever since that, that audio I've listened to several times, it planted that big seed in me. And now it's brought it into what I'm doing now, which is yeah. no competition and just created, yeah. but creation. But um, even, even like, I work out with some friends sometimes and it's fun to have a little race or whatever. But now what I'm starting to do is like, Hey, instead of seeing like who can cross the line first, let's see if we both do our time and let's see if together we can get our time under five minutes. 
Mm. Like you do your best, I'll do my best. And together we ah, have to get okay. under five minutes. That's cool to find a way to, yeah. Cause yeah. the thing is you, there is a, I do feel like there's gotta be a place for that. That I was thinking, I was even thinking this today. I was like, compare, don't compete in a world, something like mm. that where you can compare how you're doing, but you're not trying to beat each other. You're just supporting each other and being the best. And you must feel the same way. It's like being the best version of yourself and getting your best time, but it's not about beating others. And like you said, that, right. that combined goal is a good way to do that. Yeah. Right. So yeah, case against competition, good resource. Um, one yeah, one, one question I, I really have for you, I, I'm fascinated with this because at one point in my life, I really wanted to do something similar and now I don't know how, really how I feel about it. So I want to ask you about it. And that is, a long water fast. So you mm. did <laughs> shot. You did something that shocked the world, in my opinion. Definitely shocked me. I was super inspired when you did it too. You did a thirty-five day water fast a few years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thirty-five days on just water, which nothing but distilled water. Distilled water, which, specifically. Which, again, that was I would not recommend distilled for one at all. Okay, so but at I, the this, time I was this, so I would sure. Love, I yeah. would love to get into this with you. So first up, before we get into the water fasting, let's just briefly talk about distilled water and your recommendations for that. Would you recommend people drink distilled water on a daily basis? I distill my water, but then I remineralize it. Okay. So, so I, have, okay. I have this like salts, with, which is like a really, um, it's called four salts. There's like four different type of minerals within this salt that I have. That cool. Just, yeah. Okay. So I, yeah, because my t the tap water in the UK it depends where you where you're living, but in most cities the tap water is pretty. So so you right. would recommend distilled water, but just adding in some minerals thereafter. Yeah, you can just do a pinch of sea salt or something like that. Cool. Okay, sweet. Um, but at the time, at the water fast you just did pure distilled, no no minerals. Yeah, I didn't add salt. And now when I if I if I taste and compare and contrast distilled water and remineralize distilled water like. The, the human in me is just like yes this one is good for you and this one is, like i can tell but you know when you're new to stuff and you're just like yeah 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 cool so so, out. so i'm glad i'm glad we got that i'm glad we got, got clear on that because i personally just got a distiller about a month ago and dude the stuff that's left over afterwards is nasty i'm so yeah. glad i was drinking tap water before so wow for someone so I got that. conscious as well yeah there's yeah but so but many, i thought I, think, I thought bc british columbia where i'm from it's got like the best water it's super clean True, yeah yeah, I didn't think anything of it. I was very proud to drink my tap water, but now I got distiller. I'm like, oh, this is next level. But I also bought some minerals. I just wasn't sure how much I should add or whatever. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, um, I'd say a pinch of salt in like every seven, like, I don't know. You have liters? Do you use liters? or? Yeah, liters. Yeah, like yeah. 750 milliliters, like pinch of salt. Cool. Easy. Now, the fast itself, um, do you feel like, yeah, let's, let's get into the fast. And, and then I want to talk about if you think there would have been a difference had you had mineralized water versus just distilled water on that fast. So mm -hmm. first off, why did you do a 30-day water fast, 35-day water fast? Every day was, uh, <laughs> it counts. Every day was so heavy. Um, I, I was really unsatisfied with my health, with the, the, how I felt in my body um, physically. And I was really reading into uh, Arnold Errett, the mucus dust diet, that guy, um, her, Dr. Herbert Shelton, Dr. Morse, um, who's the one, Lauren Lockman. I was watching his videos and I was being around the, the raw food community. I'd seen Rovana had done a 30, 35, 40 day water fast. My friend, Sean Lee, Shout out Sean. He'd done a, a 40 day, I think he did and recommended it as well. And everything I did, it just seemed like the, the source of your ailments is all of the food you ate when you were mindlessly a child and grew up and fast food and all that stuff. And that's still in your body stored as toxins. And the only way to get to that depth is to fast because then you remove all the other stresses from the body and it can, the, the workmen can go, right, oh, we can finally deal with that. Because as long as you digest the, the belief, as long as you're digesting food daily, that's the priority task. And until you stop digesting, then the workers can't go do the other tasks that they need to do. So that was my belief. So I planned to do seven days and then 
10 days and then two weeks and I, all the books I were reading were saying the deep healing doesn't begin until 21 days so I got to 21 days and I thought okay well the deep healing's just begun I want to stay in this state so I, I thought I'll do 28 days because that's like a full moon cycle and then I thought I'd go to 40 because that was like the magic number that's what you know I don't know Gandhi Jesus or yeah, and you're only you 12 stories. you're only 12 days away at that point yeah, so I thought, well, well, I might as well just shoot for 40 days. It's a magic number, I think. Who, um, life, Dan the Man, Life Regenerator. Lou Corona. These... Yeah, Lou Corona did it too. Yeah, so it's one of those things. And there was a guy I was speaking to, actually. I forgot his name, but he'd done 40. I met him in Thailand, and he'd done 40, and he was speaking to me throughout it. And anyway, when I was going through that in the 30s, and then I woke up one day, and my body was like, I I, rec I did recognize you've got a lot of time to think and do nothing else at that point that I didn't want to get my ego attached to 40 as a number because I, I you know it doesn't take too much soul searching to go that you're just chasing a number at this point so I thought no okay I'm gonna listen to my body and it was on day 35 I woke up and was just like yeah you need to stop now because it is it's I really believe that it's it can be healthy to a point because some people just say oh you starve yourself you're starving whatever and it's like there's there's a point when it becomes starvation and there's a point when it's not and so i believed i hit that point and then decided to eat some food so this is interesting i didn't know that you were going to go in and just do seven and then just mm -hmm. do 10 and then just do 14 and then might as well 21 and then might as well 28 and then might as well 40 i didn't know yeah. that that was what happened yeah but that's cool. I thought you, I thought from the get, you're like, all right, we're doing 40 days, but then you fell five days short. Interesting. That would have been so hard to just set out to do. <laughs> Cause the, the okay. most I'd ever done so, up to that point was two, was the 48 right. hours. And, uh, but I just, I'm, I'm someone like, I just dive both feet right in. Mm -hmm. I like to go to that, that what's the end goal of this whole thing and then get the information. What's the 80% in the 20%, you know, yep. let's get that 20% as quick as possible and then get the, get out. So. so one thing, one thing I would love to talk about, albeit briefly is your reason for wanting to do it. You said that you weren't feeling good in your body. And I hear this a lot from people and I don't quite know what they mean by that. I'm sure everyone has a different meaning mm -hmm. for what they mean by that but for mm -hmm. you what do you mean when you say i didn't feel that good in my body and i wanted to yeah get rid of that what is that so i think i have a i've it's not like um systematic but there's just if you're in touch you know i was doing a bit of yoga at the time i'd grown up doing free running and ninja warrior and all different things i i've because I'm connected to my body, that's the body's the one thing that you kind of came into this world with, right? And I've really put value and stock into that. that that's the, the tool that can guide us to everything if we if we're plugged in through the physical. And my I just couldn't train my whole my whole I, I was wasn't even in my I was the end of my twenties, so uh, just before I was thirty, maybe maybe I was thirty, and. At that age, I'm, I'm watching athletes on TV hitting their prime. Mm -hmm. And I'm eating a diet I believe to be better than anyone else on TV or in the street or anything like that. And yet I have felt like I couldn't run for half as long as 50-year-olds I'd see running past me in the street or something like that. My, my joints just felt really uh, ruined. I had digestion issues and, you know, itchy butt and blood coming out sometimes and just wow you know di di i had discomfort digestion and i had my joints were just deteriorating and my muscles were uh getting injured doing really simple tasks which and you know for someone when you're like well i eat this perfect diet and i'm a proponent for this perfect diet well i believe the perfect diet and yet i've got these issues oh well it must be everything from history from before interesting that. and, so, and so, so let's just talk what was the perfect yeah. diet was it high raw fully raw what was it whole food vegan and the more raw the more perfect is what i believed okay. so fully i did believe fully raw was was perfect and but and when you I, say when you say when you say the more raw the better was it like fruit based we're talking yeah yeah yeah, yeah there's just so many, many more nuances than that I've learned since then just 
diet alone than just just the physical um what you're eating you just can't give two people the exact same diet and get the same results that's not to say there's there isn't an i believe there's an optimum human diet and i'm coming back around to the belief that it, it could be raw vegan again but there's so much other work that has to be done for that to be a potential or not done in the first place in the case of a child yeah if, if there's not and so i don't know if you want to get to the next but the next part i could start to talk about i don't know if you yeah no so 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 just to be clear you're you you were eating this this diet that you felt at the time to be perfect a whole food vegan diet the more rather better not right not perfect perfect but close as close to as you know as close, closer than yep. that like 90 percent close than the average totally. person yeah. Yep. yeah and then and so, so you're eating this way and you're seeing people on tv and youtube and they're like they're they're in their prime they're outperforming you in, in your opinion and you're wondering you're like why am i not at my peak why am i not feeling my best maybe it must be all that old shit i had been eating was gunked up in me so i should fast it away exactly and then come back okay. to this diet and it will just so, be like a fresh engine yeah okay so you do the fast and you're as you're fasting i know you mentioned multiple times you're on nature's operating table right you would just lay there yeah. and let nature operate on you yeah what what did you feel throughout the fast didn't sleep much you're quite awake which now i think may be actually your um you're in sympathetic mode a lot. I think your body, I think it might actually have been like your body's freaking out a bit more than I realized or wanted to give acknowledgement to at the time. Um, you, you, once you accept it and you accept the days without eating as a, as a byproduct, and once you're deep in it, it was actually, it was actually really easy once I got to like 20 odd days. Um, but the first week, the first two weeks were hard. And then I just, did, I did nothing. The World Cup was on. I was watching the World Cup every day. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. there's other things you would have done that may have been, you know, better. But I just, I'm not surrounded by, massively by nature. Um, I don't know. There's there's so many nuances. But my aim was, it doesn't matter what else I do, as long as I just don't eat food and let the body heal itself. Um, but it's just not, there's just, I've just learned so much since then that's to, that so, explains a lot of things. So you do the fast and on day 35, correct me if I'm wrong, but you broke it on it. Was it an unripe melon? Yeah. An unripe melon. Let's talk about the unripe melon story for a sec. What? Uh, yeah. Did you buy it? Did someone else buy it? What was the story on that? I went to the supermarket. I mean, the thing is I'm in England trying to be fruitarian and, uh, and, Os and Osborne, yeah, uh, yeah, she could attest. She's she was from nearby me actually, and she's out in Australia now. Went to the supermarket with my dad. He drove me. I bought a Piel de Sapo. Do you know that melon? F frog yeah, yeah. skin melon, really yeah. one of my my favorite melon. And I was just like, yep. Yeah. And it's kind of a part of the lesson of the whole thing. Really, it's like right i can eat now so then i just rushed into eating an unripe melon because i'm not going to wait for it to ripen and i didn't want to eat a different i didn't i didn't just go oh well then i therefore i shouldn't eat it i was like well i'm going to eat it anyway and i ate it and it burnt my mouth like okay let's talk about the first bite when you first bit into it yeah what was that like Yeah, like an explosion, <laughs> like an explosion in your mouth. Like I felt like a, a baby having the first bite of its life. Of this so, 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 so it was, it was pleasurable. It was joyful. Oh, it tasted great. It tasted incredible, but okay. it wasn't, it wasn't like an unfortunately, like it wasn't unenjoyable. And I even think that like most normal people would take a bite and it wouldn't affect them. But because I hadn't had anything of, any ph in my mouth other than mm. saliva mm. it was just so far in one direction that it just burnt wow. the whole the, my mouth was like a baby's mouth that was just completely the skin was all new and untouched and wow the taste was was you know so so you take a bite it's really good and then are you looking at that melon thinking i'm gonna eat the whole thing today or were you gonna like no to i had to really pace my stomach was so small like I at what point really, did you notice your mouth start burning like 10 minutes later Okay. And then I ate watermelon and that burnt my tongue. 
like the next thing I ate was watermelon and that burnt my tongue. So one thing burnt my mouth, the other burnt my tongue. And I was like, man, maybe. And then I swapped to um, cucumbers. Yeah. And I ate cucumbers for a few days and that was okay. And then I added cherries and cherries were okay. Gotcha. And then I started to have like celery okay. juice. So, so, so at this point, you're down how many pounds? How much did you lose? Oof. 50. 50 pounds? At least, at least yeah. Holy my lowest crap. was my lowest was 133. Um, and 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 you and you're normally walking around like around 175, 180? Yeah, I'd say about exactly wow, so 133. So after that, how soon after that, how many weeks or months went by before you switched from fully vegan to then incorporating some animal products? So I was raw for a few weeks. Yeah. And then the issues all started coming right back. Same issues that you had before. So yeah, digestive issues, joint pains. Even even on raw? Even on, on raw, yeah. <laughs> That's wow. what I'm saying. Like I believed in raw so much. Yeah. And I'd done everything else I'd believed to get to that point to just eat raw. Mm. And then all the issues came flooding back. Like they hadn't changed at all. Um, and so wow. then I was like, because for me, that fast was the second to last thing I'd ever do in my life. Like in terms of the, I was like, the very last thing I'd ever imagined myself doing was eating animal products again. Yeah, totally. The second last thing I'd ever imagined myself doing was not eating anything at all. <laughs> so it was like, I starved yeah. myself. That didn't work. Maybe all that's left is to try this, you know? Right. And so probably, you know, a, f a few months went by and I, I incorporated some, animal products and I I felt like a veil like a depression veil lifted off my head and yeah. and my body just started to feel better and my joints started to feel better and all the other stuff as well and, um, and so that's been a that was a crazy journey and 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 when that when you started to feel better did you know at the time or do you know now why you think the animal products helped you feel better? Like, was it something, a nutrient in them or something? Or what was it? The way I see it is, is more like fruit is quite um, astringent and animal products are building blocks. And so when you have the two of them, one strips you down and one builds you up. And this is the, the, cleaning in the building but if you just have one the fruit that was just astringent that's what was breaking down that was what I, it seemed like to me was just breaking down my my insides and and gotcha. running me you know ragged on the inside um and it, it, there's so many other factors in terms of the quality of the fruit and all that mm -hmm. stuff as well but but it's fundamentally i'd feel like i'd tried enough of everything within that realm and when i tried the animal products and felt better it just seemed like that was a sign to me that that was the path um for that chapter of my life that next chapter was the the there's so many of this the psychology of the whole thing as well and just the mm -hmm. being you know within veganism and being a representative of veganism and that whole movement and myself being very self-righteous you know quite not not as much as there's definitely some way more extremes than i was but still inside i was quite a judgmental person of non-vegans mm. and there's all sorts of weight on your soul that i'm coming to recognize with carrying um that kind of self-righteousness and that anger towards other people when you're vegan and you're and you're angry at them feeling like they're ruining the planet that's i'm starting to learn that and understand that that's, that's even more damaging to your soul to be a vegan and angry than to not be a vegan and not be angry in that, at right. other people because right. you're then using your willpower to affect someone else's soul negatively whereas someone else who is just doing their thing isn't in, is harming an animal but not another human soul and that's a whole other you know deeper right. discussion as well at the time but uh, at, the, at the moment i've actually stopped eating animal products other than sorry eggs um, okay. but i've stopped eating all uh, meat um, 
recently and I'm coming back around to revisit the diet, but I feel like in the last few years, and I don't know if I may as well share it now, but I feel like I've done a lot of emotional work and that was the, the missing pin in the whole, missing cog in the whole picture of everything is if you have certain emotional traumas from childhood that mm. are stored, that they're in your soul. The emotional traumas are stored in your soul. Your body is a, uh, how do I say it? Like a hollow, not a hologram isn't exactly accurate, but it's close enough of the soul. So if I have an emotional injury in my soul, my body is going to sh- uh, store that somewhere. And certain injuries store in organ, in certain organs, right? You know, everything's linked to everything. So there's the, the Chinese, like liver is anger and lungs is grief and all this different stuff. So if I have certain emotional injuries, my organ is not functioning properly. So therefore I might just not biologically be able to process a certain food group as much as another food group. Mm. And especially if I'm then also using that food choice to uh, be self-righteous towards other humans as well, that's only going to limit my body's um, capacities as well. So revisiting doing a lot of uh, emotional work to understand myself to process emotions the the main teachings i've studied is divine truth on youtube and divine truth on youtube divine truth on youtube man that guy and that the the guy who teaches that he's mostly raw vegan mm-hmm. and he's the the only human alive that has helped me to question my choice to eat animal products again and encouraged me not personally, but just encouraged me from watching his talks. And I, I am someone who has to understand something to for it to work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I have yeah. to understand something for it to work. Oh, and even if I do believe I understand something, that doesn't mean that it's going to work. Like I believed raw vegan was the best diet on the planet. It didn't work, but yeah. he's offered that that cog in the middle center of everything of the emotional work is this mm. is the soul work that is the most dude. important for all of it. Dude, it's so dude, like something a lot of people don't even aren't even aware of is that there's a guy on in the Guinness book world records who's eaten more metal and glass than anyone else in the world. Do he's yeah, metal absolutely. and glass. He's eating a plane. He's eating a plane. He's a plane. That guy too. Yeah. So, so you can eat like basically whatever, even plastic, right? Not to say it's healthy, not to say it's good. You're not to say you should, but you, you can. And, as you mentioned, Ann Osborne earlier, right? There's like legends who have eaten just fruit for many years and they're doing just fine. And there's people who've eaten a lot of meat for many years and they're doing just fine. There's my grandma. She's over, I hung out with her yesterday, actually. She's like 92, 93. She was drinking Coke and eating a pizza last night. Like she's, that's just what she does, right? And she's, she's doing all right. Her. She's like, doing all right. As much she's, as it would me or you, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and at the same time, from my personal experience, on, on, a, on a high fruit diet, my, the only like health issues I have and physical issues I have are directly related to my emotional states. Like when I'm in a really shitty emotional state, I feel it. Like my digestion sucks. I start to get some injuries coming back. Like my, I get issues, stuff stiff. And when I'm feeling amazing, I'm super happy and I'm loving life. Dude, I feel like I'm, I got nothing. I'm, I'm loose. I'm easy. I'm chill. Everything's perfect. Yeah. And I see it in others too, man. I see the most uptight people. They they're they're tight. Uh, people who don't let go of things emotionally, they have constipation issues. Like they've got all sorts of issues. But it it is the emotions. And when I've done trips on certain psychedelics, be it mushrooms or LSD or whatever, it's the most obvious thing in the world that our emotions are controlling everything, Absolutely. outside of us and inside of us. Yeah. And when you come off that trip and you're just back to like the real world. Uh, it's easy to forget that. And it's easy to think like, oh, it must be that thing or that thing or that thing, but we don't look within on the emotion. So what you're saying, the emotion was like the missing cog for you. Yeah, dude, it's the missing cog for most people, myself included. I forget that all the time. That's it. That's what, that's it. That's the, that's the revelation. Yeah, it, it, it is there. But understanding it is a whole, again, we go back to the children. They, it's effortless for the child. Yeah. We've learned, yeah. we've put, we've put up, We've learned to put res, um, restrictions, suppressions, distractions in place from feeling certain emotions because we're f- literally from our childhood, we're terrified to feel certain things 
Mm-hmm. So our whole life is then these barriers of I can't mm-hmm. do that for that, or you know, and it starts to dictate our whole life from from our emotions. And there's a rule that the the soul dominates that, which is the emotions dominate everything. So every interaction, if if you're in the gym and you suddenly pick your head up and look at a girl and you're like, I don't want to check a girl out, but something in me is automatically doing that. That's some mm-hmm. deeper trauma that's 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 causing that. Um, and that's the that's just the soul dominating. That's the emotions from childhood are there, like under the surface. That is takes a lot of work to start to. And humility is the is the journey to to start to understand and break down and work through. But and they can, you can only work through them by feeling them. You can't just namaste or do mm. enough yoga that they're going to go. Because mm. I've, I've tried all those paths. I've tried mm. you know until I actually leaned into the emotions and tried to feel what's under the surface that the law of attraction is con this is the the real layer of the law of attraction because people use it for positive things what they deem as positive but the law of attraction is always at play and it's negative and positive and so it's bringing about scenarios in your life to help you feel those emotions that are unfelt to release them wow and that often we we then project anger at that or we you know but until we are able to to recognize the law of attraction is trying to help us and it's trying to make you feel sad or whatever it is so feel sad about it like don't just you know i i spend some days now i'll spend an hour or two a day just lying in my bed feeling an emote like just trying to tune into what emote i'm like i just don't feel satisfied right now okay, okay so take time to yourself and feel unsatisfied. Don't try to distract yourself. Don't tell yourself, no, Tim, everything's fine. Actually, cool, like the man. child that just goes into, like, it's, it's this, because that's the thing, I've been down the new age path and everything where it is that trying to be overly positive or affirmations, if you're saying, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, but you don't believe it in your soul, well, then you're just lying to yourself. You have to try to live in the truth of what you feel because once you've felt it, then it's not, if, if you feel poor and I go, I feel poor, I feel poor, and that makes you sad and you, and you go into that and then you, you release that fear, that emotion, then it's no, it's no longer controlling you and dictating your life to make you actually poor and you can start to feel rich. And that, that's, that's an example, but actually being honest with ourselves about what we're feeling and then trying to lean into that feeling is a, a been a game changer for me. Cool, man. Very cool. So do you find that when you do that, when you do lean into that feeling and you face it and you embrace oh. it, you like solutions come or, or, or is it a solution that comes or do you just feel like, okay, now I'm over it. Thanks for the session. I'm done feeling that now. Now I'm going to feel what I really want to feel. Sometimes I just have like, I'd, I'll do that and I'll just have three great days. Like I'm on cloud nine for three days or something like that. Like I'll go into that emotion and I'll feel like in the past I would have just gone for a walk or gone to a yoga class when that yeah. emotion starts to come up now i'm like no there's nothing more important than sitting in this emotion right now and sometimes i can't get into it and then sometimes i'll feel angry and i'll just punch the pillow and sometimes i'll go i feel like dying like i've had those i had that one recently i was watching on the divine truth on youtube and he started and he was like yeah re- today i had this feeling that i feel like dying so that's kind of interesting and so i went he kind of said how he went into it and so i was like maybe I feel that sometimes like I didn't know I felt that I didn't know I felt that but I was just in my bed and I was like how's that thought feel yeah I kind of fucking feel that I kind of feel like and and it was a, a dark hour or two and then after it I had a really fantastic wow. few days like Dude, I had a, really like cool it was the ultimate like drug like I felt yeah. like because that <clears throat> not ignored it you know yep wow full on dude and we, and as you know from doing you know, some mushroom trips from time to time and other psychedelics, it forces you to feel those, right? You, yeah. you go down these dark points in these trips. And then when the trip's over, it's easy to, a lot easier to feel like, wow, like the weight's been lifted. Like, I'm glad yeah. I went through so, that trip. But you're saying, so, yeah, you're saying here, you don't need to take a substance, obviously. You can just feel it when it comes the, up. That's the difference now is I, I think the, the substance helped me to definitely help me. In, it felt like it helped me in the past. But when you do it, completely sober like a child who mm. does it sober that's where there's, there's a lot more strength i think and the the change is more lasting 
often oh. than with the plants when you're not fully present. And and yeah. so I, I I've put it, but I, you know everyone's on their journey. But at the moment, I'd completely uh, recommend exploring cool, it sober. But yeah. So when when we first did this, when I first in, I sent you a message, like, hey, let's do a interview for today. My main topic was going to be on the way of the rope. <laughs> we don't have too much time to get into it today, but I do want to touch on it. And then hopefully we can do like another session later where we yeah, talk sure. more into depth on it. Cause you've sure. created something beautiful. Let me bring it up. Actually, I'm going to share my screen for those who don't know, for those of you wondering why is Tim sitting in front of a box of ropes? Oh yeah. What I'm about to show you is, is why. So Tim's created something called way of the rope. Sorry. What was that? Oh, it's a foot. <laughs> but, yeah, the human foot bro it's fascinating the human foot so you got some cool branding here as always dude uh who did the logo for way of the rope hey do you know are you, you asking me to plug him no oh is it is it who i think it is i didn't know ryan I, I, did assumed, it. Yeah. I assumed it was i assumed it was shout out to ryan dude I, su- I assumed that was it looks like his style but i wasn't sure yeah. cool so this is sweet man so you're the way of the rope just briefly explain it if you give an elevator pitch for what is way of the rope so essentially, I, I've got fascinated in biomechanics. And all biomechanics is, is how the human body moves and functions, uh, the, the physical aspect of it. Now, when, a human body, when you walk, any human walks, the natural path of every joint in the body is to do this infinity symbol, which is the logo. Because we don't walk like robots where we go up and down. There's a, there's a natural figure of eight happens with the arms with the legs yeah and so the the more we can tune into that path and train every joint to move on that path and to spread the weight of uh movement throughout the joints because often someone will have a stiff shoulder and they'll move their ribs more than they need to but the the movement should be spread throughout the shoulder the elbow the wrist everything so the the rope i know it looks like poi and it looks like all these other things but it 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 those things are, are kind of greater expressions of the rope. The rope is an even simpler version that there's David Weck there running. It teaches the body, the joints, uh, the muscles, the skeletal structure and the muscul- muscul- the muscular structure to work together on this figure of eight path. Um, to, move, to move with more fluidity? With more, exactly, with more fluidity, the, the natural organic, like if you watch Usain Bolt running, his shoulders aren't stiff. The, the Americans run with stiff shoulders, mm-hmm. but the Bolt, who's got the fastest time in the world, runs like this, and that's a, there's a reason. And his, his hands will rotate and rotate, and so he's a lot more fluid than the other people. He moves less robotic. And the rope just teaches us in a simple way. It's just a simple bit of, that's why I love it. It's this simple human tool that we've had for centuries piece of rope and yet it's all you need to teach the body to move with a lot more functional ease basically so it trains this pattern of moving with more fluidity so that when yeah. you go and so that when you go and do other activities be it yoga or running or working out of the gym perhaps it, it affects how you do that as well yeah this is, well, such a beautiful, this is such a beautiful video bro <laughs> this, is, this is some national geographic shit right here Right. Um, there's a few fun there basically there's three fundamental patterns that you do with the rope and the underhand which is where you just swing side to side left and right left and right in this underhand motion is running then there's the overhand which is the inversion of that which is front crawl or throwing oh, okay and then then there's the dragon roll which is this rotational movement where the ribs and the hips move separately so the ribs will move and the hips stay stationary and that's the dragon roll and those are the three patterns and between those three, you can essentially there's all human expressions of movement from like running, swimming, throwing, punching, Sweet. hitting, um, or within those patterns. So if those help train you at a foundational level, your human being, so that then when you go back to running or swimming or martial arts or whatever it is, you will feel more fluid and functional and cool, free in man. your body when you do those movements. So it's- Dude, I know what it's like to run stiff. And there's certain coaches out there to teach you to run stiff and stay stiff. And they are. Yeah. And, and you look at this video of you running here, it's just beautiful. It's like, it looks so fluid. It's awesome. And you've trained that ability. Right. And 
as we talked about earlier, kids being this blueprint, kids are very fluid too. Kids are the opposite, anything but stiff. Exactly. They're so supple and fluid and the yeah. So supple. Yep. So and so this this for me is like again, childs have got so much potential to become athletic, and those few people like Bolt make it through, but then most of the people follow this adult path of training. And I don't really think humans have discovered what their true potential is. And that's why David Weck, who you've seen in this video, mm -hmm. he's an inventor. He's like the modern, the what Tesla was to electricity on the sets. He is to the human body. He's he's gonna he calls it locomotion 2.0. Mm. He's discovering how humans, how very few humans like Michael Jordan or Usain Bolt move. He's creating ways. He invented the Bosu ball, but he's since creating ways to train. You can see Jordan Burroughs, the wrestler there as well. And um, yeah, Jordan Burroughs. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So he's cool, cool. He's he, he comes up with these little, these gadgets that just seem like little silly inventions, right? But that's all it takes is that it's not this over crazy technology or this electrical, what it's these little silly gadgets, these, um, the pulses, these, the right. bands, the rope you see there. Yeah. That, are, that, that train, that help train the body to move like Michael Jordan or to move like Usain Bolt. Now you've got to commit some time to it, but he's, it's the blueprint. It's the, it's the pathways. It's, it's the matrix. It puts you on these, these gives you these referential points of movement. I don't know. I don't want to go too, too technical with it, but so that you, when you move, your body finds these efficient patterns effortlessly then because you've trained them, you've trained the specific patterns. It's a new way of thinking about how to train the body is to program functional patterns into the body rather than just to lift weights and run, which works for some right. people like Bolt and them. Or, or, I don't know how much weights he lifted, but it's, it's this, this middle dynamic where it's fun little games for the body with fun little gadgets that actually improve it and sharpen it. Very cool, man. So, so, so you, you mentioned in, in this video, actually, we're watching right now um, in it, if you were to watch it, you mentioned how David Weck actually, did he what, inspire you to go forward with this path of way of the rope or how did this come about? He invented the rope practice. Okay. So he invented the rope practice, but then, then you decided I, you I went to and learned, I went to San Diego and learned from him. And then, and then you decided you, know, you want to create your own ropes. Because and then I were, came back to England and wanted to share it with more people. And I thought, you know, and he gave his full blessing that I could do that. Um, and, oh. And I, and I want to help, you know, the ropes is a beautiful tool. I'm working on some other stuff. Basically, David Weck is a, a genius of our generation that most people don't recognize. And they find him very hard to understand at this point. And so my, one of my main goals in the next few years is to try and translate, prove his theories and translate it for people uh, to make it more understandable. So if you stay tuned to my YouTube in the next year, I hope to do some of that. Yes. Yeah, so if people want to test out what you're saying here with, with moving more, more fluidity with the rope, mm -hmm. uh, sure. They can go to your website and they can pick up a rope as we just saw. Can they also Either. just go to the local hardware store and buy a rope there and swing that around? Yeah, or? They could, they could, I mean, you can try it with your dressing gown belt. If you've got a dressing gown belt, you know, um, and just grab, or a normal belt you could use even a resistance band you can do it a little bit with grab two hands and just swing it under and let it come here and then swing it under and you'll see how that the spine is designed to move in six directions like tilt tilt forward mm. bend back bend and then rotate rotate and with these six directions it enables this infinity this figure of eight pounds with these six directions. And so if you swing this thing in an underhand motion, you will feel your shoulders rock and tilt and you'll, you'll go through this gyroscopic tilt mm -hmm. with the body. And the rope just allows you to get hundreds of reps in, in a very short space of time. So that it like programs the body quickly. Dude, I love that, man. Not long ago, I was sitting on my bed in a bad position and I felt mm -hmm. my lower back like go. And I was like, Oh crap, my lower back screwed. And like, I was in a lot of pain. And then a couple of days later, I was just going to stretch it out. And I'm like, dude, how often do I bend side to side and corner to corner? Like how often do I do like the hula hoop motion? You know, yeah. never. I'm like, I never in that position. I'm although always going freaking straight. 
yep. and I'm sitting down, up, down, and front and back. I'm never going yep. like, well, not even back. I'm just going forward and yep. up and down. But like, the figure of eight covers all bases. Dude, figure of eight. I, I started. I started just putting my hands on my hips and and just rolling around like I'm doing the hula hoop. Yep. And it yep. felt so good to open up those areas that have never really been open yep. before. So I can imagine yep. with the rope, it, it adds like this this cool, fun way of doing that. Uh, as well as opening up the upper body, bring that into the 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 program as well. So, yep. uh, that's that's cool, man. I like the lines. Very minimal, like you said in that video. You can just take the rope, go for a hike, go anywhere, go to the park, do it in your do it in your house, even if you got some space. Yep. But just get into that movement pattern and uh, feel how that then affects every other. It's a cool practice. It brought me a lot of a lot of joy um, in picking it up. It's something that you don't like. I, I don't make I don't make it the main practice like it's a, it's a supplement to life to training to it's almost a meditative practice as well mm. because you've got one handle in the left hand one in the right it completes this circuit right so you, you've got the circuit coming inside but then you've got this outside circuit so the left and the right hand are talking to each other they're in communication if the right hand moves the left hand has to react and if they're yeah. moving out of sync then the rope hits you. So the left and the right hand learn to move in perfect synchronization. Oh, so cool, man. They can't, they can't be half a second out. Otherwise it doesn't work. So, so cool. the, the body just, it just attenuates perfection over repetitions without you having to use any thought. And because it's the left and the right hand, both work in, in an ambidextrous kind of way, you know, the right hand works the left hemisphere and the left hand works the right hemisphere. You're crossing over your center line. So it does all this other stuff for the mind as well, which I want, you know, we don't even have to pr- I don't even I don't feel like I need to prove it scientifically but if you pick up a rope you experience it once you start doing some of the movements you're like man I just feel more centered you just feel like right. mentally more centered and other stuff um it's, it's been a cool it's been a cool discovery but it, what I was saying is you just need to I put in a few months and then now I just pick it up once a week once every few weeks and the patterns are there like you you download the software and then you don't you, you don't need to download the software anymore it's in the body like I can tune into those patterns now and it's, it's changed how I can think about movement for the rest it's of my like, life. It's like, you know what I see it as now that we talk about it, I see it like learning how to ride a bike or yeah. learning how to do a hula hoop. Like you have to learn those. And once you learn, you like you said, you can pick it up at any time and be able to do them. Yeah. But, but benefit, like, I, like I see could... you swing that rope and I'm like, I don't know how to do what you just did with the rope. And it would be cool to learn how. Just like hula hoop. Like I didn't know how at one point and I learned how. I didn't know how to ride a bike and I learned how. I didn't know how to skateboard and I learned how. Yeah. And but the thing is, this will help everything else you do. It will exactly. help you. Learn. It will help your sight. Like it's so foundational yeah. in the human movement that it that it's it, eventually you'll be like, for me, I just don't see it not being as big as yoga someday because of right. what I have experienced, what anyone else that tries it has experienced, how foundational it is. It, this is physical education. This is what children should be doing in schools, not be taught to compete in sports before they even know how to control their body this is how we learned right. coordination these are this is a coordination tool for children yeah. which, so that they don't lo- un- become uncoordinated you know um, i can see this being taught in schools for sure man it's a really cool way like here's a, here's a new movement that the class is going to learn today it just could, like we learned just like we learned hula hooping yeah and old people's homes getting up you know yeah. the gentler version get them a light rope but it gets their spine their joints mobilized it's, it's a right. nice way to rework like it's, it's got huge potential so i'm just doing my bit and um trying to get it out over here but we do we do ship um to canada but if you want the WEC method also sell uh that they sell ropes in america as well uh, but we got courses if you've got your own rope like you say go to a hardware store we sell courses um, eight weeks to fluidity course is the main one I'd recommend. I just released that like two weeks ago and that's an eight week course from. And, and so here, here, for example, someone could get all three different ropes if they want, plus an eight week course for you for yeah. less than a couple hundred euro. Yeah. Sweet. And then, and how long do these ropes last? I mean, if you use it on grass or a gym floor, it should last years, years and years. Okay. Years. Um, yeah, if you so use it on, if you use it on concrete, then it, it can wear a bit quicker. But yeah, yeah, if you use it on grass outdoors or in a gym, shouldn't shouldn't wear out at all. It's it's good Beautiful. quality rope. Like it's good quality piece of rope. And and where can people uh, where can people find you now? You said YouTube is is a good place for it to find you. Uh, I've got a personal YouTube and I've got a way of the rope YouTube. So, but yeah, go to my YouTube 
there you go go on that page i've been putting up stuff lately i've been putting podcasts if anyone you know wants to hear more of my, me ramble on about stuff um you can see honing in on health i talk a lot more in that the spirit world so where we go when we die or in our dreams um and that yeah, yeah i've man, been more you're... active on the youtube lately so and there's some ninja warrior stuff some flowability some other stuff um cool oh yeah you yeah. got some intro courses here for or intro videos here talking about the rope yeah i've done a coach's course for people that feel like they want to teach it to others as well and oh that's sweet little, yeah so it's kind of explaining the mu much more why we do each thing than just um what we do right very cool man well dude thanks a lot for uh no worries man this is fun yeah i'm glad we did this thanks for the chat i think we um hopefully shared some helpful information for people yeah i think this will like you said earlier it's just about it's about understanding i like what you said at the very start they're just like the mainstream is just a dead end path and there's a <laughs> there's another path that we don't even know where it goes but it doesn't end you know no it's infinite it's infinite, infinite. Um, yeah the last thing i, I would really just encourage um divine truth has really helped me so much with the emotional stuff and that's like i said i've been on a lot of dead ends even a lot of spiritual paths that, that ended up being dead ends you know mm -hmm. um divine truth is, is one of the first things that i've got into that's actually felt like it's brought about a uh, real change that's in my in my heart and my soul you know um this one yeah right here yeah D that verse video that overview of divine truth this one right here the two hour that's one? a good place to start yeah it's a good place to start love it man cool yeah sweet dude well thanks so much this has been great and uh, i'm sure people will connect with you on uh youtube or instagram yeah you, you can find me if you want to find me yeah your uh, instagram is human timothy at human timothy yeah yeah human timothy so we do well when the world opens back up again we'll connect for sure i'll get my dude. camera out and we'll make some epic content i i am not in any way like don't believe that could happen right now so if that does happen i will be i will be doubly ecstatic do you know what i mean i just feel <laughs> like we've lost it i feel like we've lost all travel now i'm yeah. i'm yeah. i'm not if i have to ha have a needle in my arm to travel then i'm just not traveling like that's a line well, there's a lot more there's a lot more than just a needle my friend there's a lot more than oh I, just I know that if, if, it, was, saying, if it was just a needle if it was just a needle i take a needle but there's more to it than just a needle that's what i'm saying so yeah. yeah if we actually see each other in person I, i'm 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 gonna be pretty ecstatic for that if that happens cool. yeah i'm not counting on it but it'd be nice um thank you to everyone that listened i appreciate you you know hearing hearing me uh, ramble on so thank you <laughs> all right dude much love peace big love brother peace Ciao.